And then I know that there are some of you that the Lord has been prompting you about baptism. That's the reason I got in the tank two weeks ago. Because I was standing over there, I had walked somebody over, and as I was standing there, the Lord reminded me of Psalm 133 and said, how good and precious it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It's like the oil that came down on the head of Aaron, then down upon his beard, then down upon his body. And the Lord reminded me that obedience, it's really about obedience. It's not really about anything else, is it? I said, it's about obedience in our life, isn't it? It's not really about anything else. And so I said, Lord, if oil comes on my head and then could potentially go into the body, then Lord, let me get in the tank. I'll get in it every week if that's the case. And I want to just revisit for a moment what I said to you to last week and put it in context and then I believe, and it was a, a revelation to me, maybe it won't be to you, it was to me, as I begin to understand what the Lord is doing in the earth right now. We do understand that life just does not revolve around us or our church, right? We do understand that the kingdom of God is bigger than what the Lord might be doing here. It's part of the kingdom, but we understand God is trying to do something in the earth right now. Do we understand that in the room today? Remember, and I, just let me review this for a moment because it'll, it'll help us understand what I think the Lord is trying to tell us. 400 year period, remember, between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew it's, it's known theologically as the intertestamental period. It's the time frame of 400 years between Malachi and Matthew when there really was no prophetic word. God wasn't talking. Now, God had all of the promises of the Old Testament, but there had been nothing for that 400-year period. You know, what do you do when you haven't heard from God for a long time, well, you lean on what God had already said. No prophetic word for 400 years, and you have this anticipation now by the time you get to Matthew that there is a Messiah that's coming, that something's going to change, that transition is going to happen, but there is a high level of discouragement and expectation at the same time because we're not talking about four days, four months, four years, 40 years. We're talking 400. We're talking centuries of God saying certain things and it not taking place. And it's very easy for those of us who are evaluative and detailed and people that, that want to know the facts, factual individuals, if we don't see something happening immediately, then we begin to doubt if it was God at all or if we think it was God, the enemy will put in our head and tell us God does not keep his word. Anybody ever had the, Lord, the devil say that to you before? God's not going to keep his word to you. God is a liar. Anybody ever had that come to your head before? So there's this 400 year time period and nothing is happening. And then, as I mentioned in, in Luke's gospel chapter 3, you have the historical account of who happened to be in charge and the reign of Tiberius. Now the Caesars were in charge. These were wicked people. The Herods took over the land of Judea where Jesus would be born in Pontius Pilate was governor, Herod Antipas, Philip, all of these people, Lysanias and Annas and Caiaphas were high priests and, and all of this political stuff was going on and it almost wasn't fair because the politics, the government of the day had taken over and oppressed 
the Jewish people. I need you to hear something this morning. We are now being placed in the context of the first century in America because you've been asking for first century power, but you don't get first century power without first century problems. You, you, you need to understand that. And so there's all of this political stuff that is going on, and these are wicked, evil leaders. The Jews were being taxed at a 70% level. Heard that number thrown around before? And they also were tithing on top of that because they believed that no matter how bad their situation was, they were still obligated to God. We could learn a lesson from that. And they were living on about 20% of their income. That's why that they were in poverty. Pressed by the Romans and they, they hated the Romans. And actually the Romans hated them. And if you were not a Roman citizen, which many of the Jews were not, then you had to do whatever the Romans told you. And Herod was taxing the Roman people to fund all of his 10 projects that he had going at, he had 10 building projects going on at the same time. And he was taxing the Roman people in order to do what he wanted to do to get done. And in the middle of all of this, and I talked to you about this last week, at that time, in that moment, I, I, I want you to understand that we are being set up right now in America and around the world for a first century model. At that time, at what time? At that time when those people were in power, at that time when those people were doing their stuff, at that time when those evil individuals were in charge and they were disregarding God, a message came to John. Now, we don't know how the message came to John. God speaks differently. And as I read this, I thought, John who? Nobody's heard of John. This is another unfulfilled promise. 30 years prior to this, a guy is in the temple, Zechariah, and he's doing his service in the temple. And because there were so many priests, it might be only once or twice in a lifetime when the priest would actually be able to go into the temple and offer the incense, which was a type of prayer. And so Zechariah, he's inside the temple. He's offering the incense that people outside are praying. And suddenly an angel appears to him. And says this to him, your prayer is answered. What prayer? Not the prayer for a baby. He quit praying that prayer decades ago. Read the Bible. Both of them were old people. They had no more expectation that there was ever going to be a baby. That hope had gone. And suddenly the angel appears to him and says, you're going to have a baby. He says, I don't know if I believe that or not. And God closes his mouth. Why does God close his mouth? Why does God close our mouth sometimes? Because we open it up in unbelief too much. And God said, I'm going to shut this man up for nine months so he doesn't put so much doubt in his wife's mind that she can get pregnant. She gets pregnant. And there's all of this prophecy, prophecy stuff that's going around with, with John. The word of the Lord comes. He, he's going to be great. He's going to turn Israel back to God. He's going to turn the, the hearts of the parents back to the children. And all of this is great. And the baby is born. And they go into the temple. And there's a prophetic word. And then we don't hear another word. For 30 years. Nothing. You can, you can hear, you can hear the, the, the friends of, of Elizabeth and Zechariah. 
Because they were told to raise the boy. He can't drink certain things. He can't eat certain things. And he's going to have to wear certain things. And can't you just hear, can't you just hear some of the, the, the neighbors? <laughs> well, they're raising a weird boy. <laughs> he doesn't have any friends. Let me, let, me, let me tell you something, mom and dad. Don't be so concerned that your kids don't have friends. It might be God's hand on their life to prepare them for something that's greater than friends. You know, we try to do as parents, we try to, to vicariously relive our teenage lives through our children. So we think, oh, it'll be good. They'll have a little boyfriend. They'll have a little girlfriend. We'll just all be together. Be careful that you're not shortchanging what God is trying to do within the life of your child. Because I believe that God is attempting to raise up young men and women that have a different standard than we had, that had a different dedication than we had. He's trying to raise up young men and women that have a Nazarite vow that are separate to God. What's, it's not doing anything. All they are is alone all the time. So is John. No, no, nobody hears anything from John for 30 years. It's another unfulfilled promise. And then suddenly, the word of the Lord comes to John. It's estimated that John ministered to about 700,000 people in his short ministry. And, and, and notice, and I, and I talked to you about this last week, and I'm just, just putting this in context again. God was now shifting history. Listen, this was a, an historical shift. Everything was now changing. And what was the sign? What did I tell you the sign was? Baptism. Jews had already understood that. They, they'd been ritually baptized all the time. And John starts baptizing and the Pharisees stand off and they say, we don't need that. We already did that. And, and, it, and it shows in, in, in Luke chapter 3, he's, he, he starts to preach repentance. And then he shows two kinds of fire in, uh, in verse number 9. And then in, in verse number 21, there's the fire of judgment for those that criticized it. But then there's the bapt in verse 16, the baptism of fire in the Holy Spirit for those that said yes to it. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care how odd or weird or embarrassing it looks. If it's God, I want it. And oftentimes what God does at the beginning of moves and shifts in history, he will test the religious spirits of his people by something that is very common and something that's very normal to see whether or not they're going to lean into it or stand off and criticize and say, that's not for me. That's only for people who have issues. I just want to remind everybody in the room, look at somebody and say, you have issues. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then Jesus is baptized. Okay, that was last week. Jesus, is, he doesn't need to be baptized. He doesn't need to be baptized. Does everybody understand? Jesus is perfect. He doesn't need to be baptized, but he does it anyway to show everybody else what they need to do. Right, okay. So then I, I, I'm walking out of the kids' entrance door after a morning staff meeting on Monday. And I felt the presence of God just come all over me. And the Lord reminded me of something. He reminded me of another 400-year time period that was shifting history. Genesis chapter 15 Abraham, he's Abram then, he falls into a deep sleep and he's going to go through this ceremony where they would cut an animal in half and God would walk through the animal and the person would walk through the animal and the person that would break the covenant 
the, the type of that is that you would be cut in half too. That was the imagery of it. And so Abraham falls into deep, deep sleep and a terrifying darkness comes down over him. And the Lord says to Abraham, you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for how long? You've got to wait 400 years. Sheesh. This is why I want you to understand that what God does in your life is not individual, it's generational. You just can't live for yourself. You just can't live for today. You've got to live for the generations that are coming because God's intent is to fulfill every word he's ever said. That's why a lot of the promises of God on your life will be fulfilled in your children because God, your anointing is transferred through the generations. That's why you can't give up. That's why you can't just say, forget it. That's why you can't say, God's not faithful to me. It's because you've got to hold on to God for the generations that are coming. Do you understand that? So what happens? Well, there's Abraham, Isaac, and it doesn't even happen until Jacob. He has 12, 12 kids, and they birth the 12 tribes of Israel. They grow. There's about 70 of them. Joseph is one of the sons is thrown into slavery. He goes to Egypt. All the brothers come to Egypt. They see that Joseph is now the prime minister, the leader. They all go to Egypt, and they grow and they expand, and they multiply, and they are enslaved. 400 years. Now, some of your translations, and people don't understand, it says 430 years. Well, no, they were there 430 years, but in, in slavery, 400 years. Well, what about the 30 years? That's 30 of those years that the Pharaoh was favorable who knew Joseph. So that wasn't slavery time. Now they're in slavery for 400 years. There's no promise of God being fulfilled here. We're in slavery decade after decade and century after century after century. God appears to a man named Moses. He says, I'm going to bring you into the land of Egypt and you're going to set my people free. Moses says, not me. That's your job, God. And God says, they're your people, not mine. He goes to Egypt and, and the word of the Lord comes to Moses, to Pharaoh about Egypt. And in Exodus 12, he says, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. Now, I don't have time to go through this this morning because I know that God's going to talk to some of you today. But every one of the 10 plagues of Egypt, and here they are, there were 10 plagues. Every one of them was a judgment against a God, a specific God of Egypt. In, in plague number one, the Nile was turned to blood. That was the Egyptian, Egyptian God Osiris, that, who was the God of the Nile. And, and the frogs was the Egyptian God Hecht, who was depicted with a head and the body of a frog. Plague three, the Egyptian God was killed, was directed at Geb. Plague number four, the flies, the Egyptian god judge was Hattuck. The Egyptian god was depicted as a fly. The death of the cattle, the Egypt, they, they thought cattle were sacred. The Egyptian god was Hathor, the cow-headed goddess of the desert. Plague number six, the boils on the skin. The Egyptian god was Thoth. He was supposed to be the god of healing and, and, and medical intelligence. And plague number seven, the fire with the hail. The Egyptian god was Shu, the wind god. And plague eight, the locust. The Egyptian god was Serapa, the god meant to protect. Egypt from locusts. Plague number nine, the darkness. Ra, everybody knows about that God, the worship of the sun. And plague number 10, the, the death of the firstborn was Tared. He protected the firstborn and it was also a judgment upon Pharaoh because Pharaoh was looked at a comp compilation of all of the gods. And God judged, listen, what has happened over the last year, God has judged the entertainment ministry, in, uh, industry in America and found them wanting. God has judged the sports industry, industry in America. They've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And God has judged the church in America because the reason God shut down the church, don't blame the devil, the reason God shut down the church was to see whether or not the people of God would find themselves hungering after God again or they would just say, okay, whatever, we'll just do whatever everybody else tells us to do and whether or not we would want to get back to normal or if we we would really want God to show up again. 
God's judged it. Now, now, now watch this. You have the judgment on the plagues of Egypt. And when you get to plague number three, which is the gnats, the lice. Watch this. And, th and this is what the Lord, the Lord said to me in, in Exodus chapter 18. This is when I really felt the presence of God came all over me. Since the gnats were on the people and animals everywhere. Now the first two plagues, the magicians of Egypt duplicated There's been a lot of duplication that's gone on in the church. But now God says, I'm going to do something that nobody can duplicate. I'm telling you what God is getting ready to do. He's going to do something in the earth that nobody can duplicate. And they'll only be able to say, this is God. And this is what the Lord said to me in Exodus chapter 8. Since the gnats were on the people and animals everywhere, the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Then I remembered Luke chapter 11, and Jesus is arguing here with, or they're arguing with Jesus. He's just telling them the facts. They're blaming Jesus because he's casting out demons by, by the devil himself. And he says, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then it means the kingdom of God has now come. And I heard the Lord say to me, let what I'm doing and what I'm going to do be my fingerprint and not yours. So then, as I thought through all of this, I said to myself, I wonder what was going on 400 years ago right now, from right now. Just a thought crossed my head. I wonder what was going on 400 years ago. Remember, the 400 years of slavery would now begin a nationwide shift. The nation would shift when Moses showed up and would bring the people of Israel out of slavery. The nation was now shifting when God was going to start baptizing people and Jesus would come on the scene. Nothing would ever be the same again. So I asked myself, what was going on 400 years ago? Just a thought came to my head. So I said, all right, let me look it up. 400 years ago, from right now, this past November, 400 years ago, a group of about 70 people signed a document called the Mayflower Compact which was the first governing body of what would eventually become America. Here's how it starts. It says, in the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, well, they did dread him too, our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, defender of the faith, having undertaken, listen, for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. What was happening 400 years ago? God was shifting everything to start a nation under God. So what are you saying? You got to hear this. You got to understand this. Right now, God is shifting this nation. And you've got to have spiritual eyes to see it. God is shifting this nation to begin to fulfill every promise he ever made 400 years ago. Suddenly, as I began to look at that this week, I said, I kind of said, wow. What does that mean for you and for me? It means, number one, that we need to put ourselves in a place where we don't miss what God is doing and think 
that it's going to be the same as it always was. Psalm 78 said, I'm going to show you things hidden from your past. What's it mean for you as an individual? It means that some of the long-held promises to your family line, long before you even came along, and some of them that God has given to you, those promises that look like they are unfulfilled, that look like God is not going to keep His word, that look like God has lied to you, that look like it will never take place, that feel like it was just a, a random thought in your head when you were standing in church worshiping or by yourself driving down the road or praying to God and you felt in the light that God was giving you something and now it's dark, God wants you to understand, don't doubt in the darkness what God has given you in the light because there are promises that are getting ready suddenly that are going to break open for you, for your family, for your children. And it may have seemed like God was a million miles away. I never heard from God. That wasn't God. Even what I read in His Word wasn't God. I'm telling you, there now is a worldwide shift that is happening and the breath of God is getting ready to raise that up which has been dead and buried and forgotten and you are going to see God do something you have never seen. Now come on, stand to your feet with me right now and lift a hand to Jesus.